Hello guys, let's talk about my second favorite thermodynamic quantity, the Gibbs free energy. So we already talked about spontaneous reactions and actually both the enthalpy, the entropy and the temperature play a role in determining whether a process is spontaneous. The change in Gibbs free energy or delta G can predict the direction of the chemical reaction under constant temperature and constant pressure conditions and delta G can be calculated using the change in enthalpy minus the temperature times the change in entropy. Now if delta G is negative that means that the forward reaction is spontaneous. If delta G equals to zero then the system is going to be at equilibrium. If delta G is positive, then the reaction is non-spontaneous in the forward direction, but it is spontaneous in the reverse direction. Now, the sign of delta H and delta S actually affects the reaction spontaneity. If we have a delta S that is positive, when we multiply it by minus T, we are going to get a negative value. Now, if the delta H is also negative, the two together is going to give us a negative delta G at all temperatures, meaning that the process is going to be spontaneous in the forward direction. Now, if we keep delta S positive, minus T delta S is negative, but delta H is also positive, then at high temperatures, this negative part, the minus T delta S is going to be larger. So when I add the large negative volume to a small positive volume, I'm going to get a negative delta G at high temperatures. However, if my minus T delta S is tiny at low temperatures, then my delta G is going to be positive. Now, if delta S is negative, multiplying it by minus T will give us a positive volume. If delta H is also positive, then delta G comes out as a positive volume at all temperatures, meaning that the reaction is non-spontaneous in the forward direction. However, if delta S negative, minus T delta S is positive, and delta H is negative, it's going to again depend on the temperature. When the temperature is small, then the delta H is going to be relatively larger, so at low temperatures our delta G is going to end up being negative just like delta H, however at high temperatures the delta G is going to end up being positive because the positive part of the equation is going to be larger. All right, I hope this makes sense. Now, there are a couple of other ways how we can calculate the Gibbs free energy. We defined the standard enthalpies of formation or delta H F as the enthalpy change when a substance is formed from its elements under standard conditions. Now, similarly, we can define the standard free energies of formation or delta GF standard for a substance as the free energy change for its formation from its elements under standard conditions. Now, just for the standard heats of formation, the free energies of elements in their standard states are also equal to zero. And we can use the same formula substituting the delta H formations for delta G formations. So the Gibbs free energies here. And also we can calculate the change in Gibbs free energy under standard conditions if we use standard enthalpy change and standard entropy change. Now under any condition, standard or non-standard, the free energy change can be calculated from the standard free energy change plus R, the gas constant, multiplied by T, the temperature in Kelvin, times ln Q, Q, the reaction quotient from equilibrium. So at equilibrium, 
Q the reaction quotient actually equals to the equilibrium constant and delta G is equals to zero, which we learned on the previous slide. So delta G becomes zero and RT ln Q can be replaced by a K because we are at equilibrium, so we can use the equilibrium constant. From here, rearranging the equation, we can always calculate the standard change in Gibbs energy by minus RT ln K, where again, R is going to be our gas constant, T is going to be our temperature in Kelvin, and ln is the natural logarithm of the equilibrium constant. Now, let's do a practice problem. Let's calculate the free energy change for the following reaction at 300 and 600 kelvins. Let's assume that the standard change in enthalpy and entropy are temperature independent, meaning that we will be able to use these values for calculating both the 300 and the 600 Kelvin temperature delta G values. Now let's look at the table that we used on the first slide. When we have a negative entropy value and the negative enthalpy value, we expect to have a delta G, which is negative at low temperatures and positive at high temperatures. So let's check that. Let's start with a 300 Kelvin delta G calculation. So delta G equals delta H, which is here minus 92.38 kilojoules minus the temperature, which is 300 Kelvin multiplied by the change in entropy, which is minus 198.3 joules per Kelvin. Now you can see that we have kilojoules and joules here, so let's convert the joules into kilojoules. So we need to multiply this by joules, kilojoules on top. One kilojoule is 1000 joule, and let's double check the units. The Kelvins will cancel out, the joules will cancel out, so I'm going to end up with kilojoules. And when you do this calculation, you are going to get minus 30 32.9. Okay, so that fits because I have a lower temperature and I expected a negative delta G value, which means that my reaction is going to be spontaneous in the forward direction. Now, what happens at 600 Kelvin? So here, delta G equals to, again, minus 92.38 kilojoules minus 600 Kelvin multiplied by minus 198.3 joules per Kelvin multiplied by the conversion factor. Okay, so let's double check the units. Kelvins will cancel out, joules will cancel out. We end up with kilojoules. And if you do this calculation, you are going to get 26.6 kilojoules, which fits because this is indeed a positive value for the delta G, which means that at high temperatures, the formation of ammonia in this reaction, which is the so-called Haber process, is going to be spontaneous in the reverse direction. All right, I hope this makes sense. See you in the next video.